fun little story about uh, my week last week. And uh, if you guys are friends with me on Facebook, the kind of a random thing that happened. I got hit by a car last week running. Um, not, don't, don't think like, you know, like thrown across like six lanes of traffic. But I, uh, speaking of the sirens out there, I got, I got bumped uh, by a car. I was out for a run, and I was on 924, and I was heading up 924. And if you're familiar with our area, going up Emerton Road, you know, there's that new Rosedale Bank, and then there's the Dunkin' Donuts, which you're definitely familiar with. And, uh, and uh, as, I'm, as I'm driving up, now there's two places I'm really careful about on my run. I'm careful about the Dunkin' Donuts and the liquor store because everybody is either leaving there in a hurry or coming there in a hurry. And so I'm always very careful crossing those roads. And so as I'm running across that sidewalk, the, the lady in the minivan, kind of she looked right and she looked left, and I thought she saw me on the sidewalk, so I, I proceeded to cross the intersection. And about, about uh, three-quarters of the way past the car, past the car I, I feel this like, push on my side and boom there's a car and so she ran into me and, and uh, kind of knocked me over into the traffic it was it was a glorified bump but I, I came home I, fin- I went and I finished my finished another couple miles of my run and uh, was feeling pretty good and I sat down and I was kind of nonchalantly told Pam hey guess what I got hit by a car on this run and her eyes kind of got real big and like are you serious like yeah just a, just a little bump a glorified a glorified push but yeah car made impact with my body and it was kind of weird and uh, kind of freaked me out for a second and so, so all, all throughout the day, uh, she's like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you feeling all right? Uh, and everyone else is kind of like, you're going to feel it tomorrow. You're going to be hurt. And so it kind of it made me laugh because it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. But that's, that's the opposite of how I normally am when I'm hurt. And so like, I was not putting on a front. I'm not, I'm not trying to be tough. When I am hurt or when I'm sick, I, I go full in child mode. Like I, I go, I, I, this is the, so I am not inherently a tough person when I'm sick. I mean, when I have a cold, I'm making noises, I'm moping around the, I'm moping around the, the house, I want to sleep all day, I don't want to do any work, or don't talk to me. Like the minor cold will, will throw me off to the biggest whiner. I, I go full on child. When, when, I, when, my, when my back hurt and I was having back issues a little while ago, I mean, every time I'd bend down, I'd be like, oh, I mean, I, want, I wanted everyone in the house to know that I was in pain and you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You stub your toe, and Pam's like, did it, just, did it fall off? No, I just bumped it. So, so normally, when I get hurt or when I get sick, I become like a child. Like, I am just dramatic and throwing myself around and moaning, and I'm working on it, but, but I, I become very childlike in that moment because I, I, I just don't tough it through. Pam, no issues. She gets sick. She gets cold. She gets hurt. I mean, you wouldn't even know it, but she pushes through. And here's why I bring this up. Here's why I tell you this story. When we think about becoming a child, whether you're being dramatic about being hurt or sick or whatever it might be, when we think about becoming childlike, we often have a negative view of that, don't we? Like we think that's not a good thing. When you say quit being a baby about it or quit, quit acting like a kid, we're, no offense to kids, we're saying grow up. Like quit being a baby about it. Grow up and, and do something about it or, or you know, have a more mature attitude about it. And so, like, with kids, we associate things like selfishness. Like, I want it my way. I want, things, I want things the way I want it. It's all about me. When someone's acting childish, we think they're selfish. Or sometimes when someone's acting childish, we think they're, they're, they're irresponsible or they're forgetful. Or they're not, not doing it. They're not doing things for themselves. We think about them being dependent on others. You know, my, my kids, and, and even now, even at 10 years old, Kaylin and other kids, and particularly the younger kids, they're completely dependent on us. You know, Hannah, she, she can't make her food for herself. She can't tie her shoes for herself. She can't do a lot of things for herself. And so she is dependent on us. And so when we think about being a child, we don't want to be labeled childlike. We don't want someone to think of us as a child. Like, that's typically a bad pushback sort of thing. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus tells us, and he taught us in his word, that to have the kind of faith that God wants us to have, it should be a childlike faith. Now think about that for a second because we have all this negative picture about, about, about being childlike. We don't want to be childlike. We call people children and babies when they're acting like children. But then Jesus tells us, as we're going to see today, that in order to have the faith that God desires for us to have, we have to become like a child. And what he means by that is that there are characteristics of how a child lives his life or her life that are, that are modeled and desired for us as we have our faith. 
That dependency that a child has on its parents is the attitude we should have to God. That radical trust that a newborn has for his mom or for that a child has for its parents is a radical trust that we should have for God, that, that longing. And that's hard for us. That's hard for me because I want to be independent. I want to be a big boy. I want to be in control. I, I want to feel like I have some moderate uh, sense of self-sustaining illusion in my life that I can, I can make things happen on my own. I want that for me. So to be childlike in my faith is hard. It's hard. And so we want to look at what it means to be childlike today. We want to think about what it means to know God by being like a child again. And not just, not just generally, but specifically as it comes to prayer. You know, we're in the middle of the sermon series on prayer. We're now three weeks in, looking at what does it mean to become people of prayer. And what I want to talk about this morning is simply... If you want to learn to pray well, you have to learn to pray from the posture of a child. You have to learn to approach God with the heart and the posture of a child. So, so let's look at this passage here together. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the children of God like a little child will never enter it. And after taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Now let's just process this story for a second. I want to, it's a little bit of a different sermon for me because normally I'd walk through the passage and, and draw out truths as we walk verse by verse through a passage. I want to talk about this story and then apply it specifically to how you and I pray. So it's a little bit different, but I think, it's just, I think you're going to walk away seeing the importance of how to approach God as a child and with a childlike attitude as we pray. The story starts out with a very simple situation. Jesus is there. And people are bringing their children to him so that they might touch him. Like, they just want to be near Jesus. They just want to experience Jesus, these children. And so people, parents, are, are bringing their children to Jesus so that they can be near him and they can know him. But the disciples, for whatever reason, are like, nope. That Jesus, is, Jesus is off limits. They, they rebuke, which is a strong word of warning. Get out of here. It's like, get out of here, kid. We don't want you, don't, we don't want you around here. Now, that, that sounds almost harsh to us because we, we see children through a different lens than in Jesus' day. You know, 2,000 years has changed how we view kids. To a degree, in our, in our culture, we can almost idolize our children. We, we prop them up on a pedestal that's, that's higher than God. That becomes a chief priority. You know, they become, like these, they become the, the cuteness factor and all these sorts of things. But in Jesus' day, there was a very different perspective on children where they actually undervalued children. Children were considered very little, little worth, more of, a, more of a responsibility to be managed than a, than a child to love and invest in it sometimes. And so children had, had very little merit, very little value. And so the idea that a child, of somebody of no value until they're grown up, would have access to somebody as valuable as Jesus was, was already outside of cultural bounds. And so the disciples were doing what, what good bouncers would do. You're not welcome here. You're not valuable enough to be in this club or this place or this room. You don't have a ticket because you're not worthy. You're not valuable enough. That's how they saw children. That's how culture saw children. But then Jesus, when he heard of it, I love what it says here. He says that he was indignant. Like he was mad, mad, mad. He was furious. And he told the disciples, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus let the children come. And this is what I love about Jesus. This is what we should all love about Jesus. And this is, what we, this is how we should live like Jesus. Because where, where Jesus was constantly shaking up what culture valued and what culture called unworthy. Jesus was constantly reversing the roles. He was constantly going to those who were marginalized and undervalued, 
So whether they were, you know, women or foreigners or, or tax collectors or this kind of sinner or that kind of sinner, Jesus was constantly showing and giving attention to those who culture had written off. And we see it right here. Let the children come to me. Jesus values those who others see no value in. And just let that be encouraging for a moment because all these little chil- children wanted to do was get to Jesus and they're being stiff-armed. And you might experience that sometime where, you, where, where it just feels like, like people are trying to keep you from doing what God wants or who God wants you to be, but yet Jesus, Jesus looks at these children and he sees value where others don't see value. Jesus sees value in them where others don't see value in them. And Jesus sees value in you where others don't see value in you. And so he invites them, let the children come. But then he turns it and he gives a spiritual lesson. He gives a spiritual principle here because he says, he says this very clearly. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So whoever does not receive God, receive the kingdom of God, his truths, his principle, the teaching of God's word, like a little child, cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so rather than just saying, hey, kids have value, let them come to me, he shows his disciple, you need to become like them. You need to adopt the attitude like these children. You need to live like these children when it comes to your faith. We need to have a childlike faith. And so he, he, and then he pulls them into the arms and he, he blesses them. But he calls us here, Jesus is telling us basically, stop trying to be a grown-up and adulting all the time. Become like a child as you approach God. Be dependent on God. Be full of the bubbling love and hope that a child has for their parents. Have that for God. Become childlike before God. And so all, that principle, by the way, ripples into every single corner of your life and my life. How we wake up in the morning, are you going to be dependent and on yourself or are you going to be childlike and dependent on God? Are you going to view yourself through the lens of a master of your universe or are you going to view yourself as a child of God? Are you going to try to conquer sin and life and whatever you have in your life uh, by yourself like an independent adult or are you going to view yourself as a child desperately in need of their parent? So every single corner of our life is affected by this idea. But I really think our prayers, our posture before God as we pray, is affected by what Jesus says here. We must become like a child to know and experience God's kingdom. To enter into it, we have to become like a child. And we see that here in prayer. So so the question I have, the the big question I have here is, how do we learn to to become a child Become like a child in prayer. What does it look like for us to become like a child when we pray? And so here's just a couple of thoughts. We're we're pulling from this story, and we're specifically applying it to how you go before God in prayer. And here's the first thought. If we're going to learn to be a childlike and have a childlike faith in our prayers, we have to learn to approach God with our mess. We have to learn to come to God messy and broken and and messed up. We have to learn to approach God in that way. If we want to pray like a child, we have to come to God with the mess like a child would come to their parent with their mess. You know, Jesus tells us something very important in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says simply, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened or heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus literally calls us to come to him with our brokenness, our worries, our anxieties, our burdens, all the things that are are messy in our lives and weighing us down and and costing us and, and our thoughts are going toward, all the hardships that we experience. Jesus literally says, bring them all to me. Bring every single one of them to me. I want them. We have to learn to take our mess to God. We have to learn to come as we are before God. 
You know, that, that phrase, come as you are, is an important phrase for how we talk to people sometimes. Maybe you've heard that, you know, whenever someone's invited to church or our church or other churches, sometimes they, they, people will ask you a question like, what do I wear? Where do I go? Or can, what, what's it like? And we often use the phrase, just, just come as you are. What would you normally wear on Sunday morning? Is it appropriate? Then, then you know, is, is it decent? Then come on Sunday morning and join us. What would you normally wear to a movie? What would you normally wear to this? What would you normally do? Come as you are comfortable. Come as you are. And throughout this summer, just to give you a fun statistic, we've served um, about 4,100 people at outreach events this summer. And so literally I've had hundreds of conversations with families and people about, hey, come check out what we're doing, or if you're interested, we're here. And, And come as you are. Come as you are. And the idea is here, you don't have to outwardly clean yourself up. And there's also a spiritual principle here that that we all come with an inward mess. And you don't have to be perfect to walk in the doors of a church. Like church is not for perfect people. And so you don't have to spiritually clean yourself up to come to God. Sometimes our attitudes are rotten, but we can still bring those to Jesus. Sometimes our hearts are far from him, but we can still pursue God in worship. We don't have to be perfect outward or inward to come to God. Jesus says, come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now here's the problem. That's hard to do. We say come as you are, but that's hard to do because something in our hearts wants to be accepted, wants to be adult-like, wants to fix things for ourselves, so we try to clean ourselves up and then go to God, thinking that he'll appreciate our efforts thinking that somehow we'll we'll make God happy if we we try to clean ourselves up first on our own and then come to him with our weariness and our heavy laden and our burdens. So we we don't come as we are. We try to clean up who we are. But the problem is we are not capable as children before God of cleaning up our mess. We are not capable of cleaning up our mess. I tell you, I've got three kids. There are times when they are not capable of cleaning up their messes. They may try, they may want to, but when you walk in the kitchen floor and you go, why is this sticky? Oh, I spilled juice and I tried to clean it up with this single little tiny piece of tissue. Oh, really? So that's why the ants are here now. That's why my foot's glued to the floor. We are not capable sometimes of cleaning up our mess, but yet we try. And so sometimes we, when we come, when we try to come to God and prayer, I really believe prayer magnifies our mess. Because when we begin to pray, I don't know about you, but when I begin to pray, particularly when I begin confessing my sins, man, I can be just crippled with how, how far I wander sometimes in my heart and my minds and my actions. And it becomes a hard moment because we, we want to stop. Like, get me out of here, God. Let's go back to, you know, praising you and, and, and thanking you. I don't want, I want to get to my heart here. And so, so, so prayer seems to, to magnify sometimes the mess that's in our hearts. Or sometimes when you go to pray and you're struggling to pray, you're, you're bored in your prayer and you're like, God, what's wrong with me? I'm a mess. I can't even pray when I want to pray. Paul Miller says this quote, and we'll put it up here on the screen. Paul Miller, in fact, he's got a great book where some of these principles come out called A Praying Life. Paul Miller in A Praying Life says this, Nothing exposes our selfishness and spiritual powerlessness like prayer. Isn't that true? Nothing exposes the hardness of our hearts, the selfishness of our hearts, and the spiritual powerlessness we have in our lives than getting on our knees before God. We see our mess. I remember, you know, several years ago going through a really dry spiritual moment, you know, dealing with depression, dealing with some sin in my life, and, and, and there was no freshness there. My desire for God was not there. I couldn't tell you the last time I read my Bible just for fun and just for to know God. And, and in the middle of this, as I began to kind of realize what was going on in my heart, the, the, because it, you drift slowly, you know what I mean? Like you begin sometimes, it's not, it's not a one day thing, it's a slow drift. And when I began to realize how far my heart had drifted from God, I began to try to pray again. And when I began to pray, that's when I realized, wow, God has been a long time, and here's my, here's my mess. Here's, here's what's going on. We, we get uncomfortable as adults coming to God with our mess. But contrast that with a child, okay? Think about your kids or kids you've known. Kids have no problem going to their parent with a mess. I mean, Hannah, when she spills chocolate milk on herself at, at breakfast or something, 
Like, I don't care what I'm doing. She's there with a, with a shaky cup coming down the hallway. Like, she wants her mess cleaned up. Like, she has no problem running to us with a mess. She has no problem coming and saying, can you help me wash my hands? And, and our kids have no problem even emotionally coming to their parent. When something is bothering a child, they blurt it out. They don't care where you are. They don't care what's going on in your life. They're going to ask you the hard questions. There, there's no appropriate time or not. In fact, most of the time, it's not appropriate time. They, they just come out. When, when something's bugging a kid, they just blurt it out. Their hearts are fresh. But yet, we, as adults, we put this, this messiness filter on us. God is delighted when we move past the, the desire to be fake and pretend we have it all together and we come to God weary and heavy laden and look for him to rest. God delights it when we come to him in our rest. So, so come to God overwhelmed. Come to God with hearts that are struggling to pray. Come to God with your mess. Come to God unashamed. God knows everything. And come to God as the real you. You know, one of the dangers in prayer is this. We, we try, we, because we're afraid to embrace our mess before God in prayer, we come to God as a person we're not really. Like we, we lean into mechanical prayers or, or prayer lists or, or this structure or that structure. We don't just simply come to God because we know if we came to God, there'd be a mess there. So even before God, who, who knows us and created us and knows every single one of our thoughts, we try to put on this adult-like front that everything's okay. When God knows, and so, so God, God doesn't want the fake you, he wants the messy you. And so we can't disconnect our hearts from God even in prayer. And I'll say this, God wants the real you when we pray, and the real you is messy. When you pray, God wants the real you. And all, for all of us, the real you is a mess. There's messiness there. You know, sometimes in our prayer life, I'll give you a picture. I, um, we, we try to cover up. We shut the door to those areas of our lives and don't bring them up before God. You know, when I was, um, when I was a sophomore in college, I bought a, a little mini fridge. And I bought it from some senior graduating. He didn't want to move it. And so for like 12 bucks and a burrito, I bought him a mini fridge. And um, I kept it for like 15 years. I love this little mini fridge. It was, I mean, it was like pretend wood looking. It was, it was ghetto and messy. It was awesome. I loved it. Rattled when it turned on. But I used that thing for 15 years. And I, eventually I brought it to my a church office when I was at a church where I had a, a building and I had a church office, and so I brought this mini fridge to my, to my church office, and the intention was, hey, I'll put, like, leftovers in there to heat up. I'll have some food on tap, and, and, and it never quite worked out that way because I'm a forgetful person. And so I'd bring in a salad for lunch, and I'd forget it's there. You know, four weeks later, it's, it's black and melted and disintegrated. I'd, I'd bring in fruit and, and, you know, tacos, and I'd put them in the refrigerator, and inevitably, like, for a week, I'd be good about pulling food out and keeping, keeping things clean, but then like a month or two would go by and I would realize it's been a long time since I opened up that, that refrigerator. I, I wonder what's in there. And so instead of being a responsible adult, I just leave the door shut for another couple months or another couple months, another year or two. And so every once in a while, I'd have to open it up and just you know, de decon the place. And, and, and eventually I just threw the refrigerator right out because I didn't, I didn't know it was inside it anymore. I duct taped it closed and threw it away. But <laughs> don't ever come to my house. Um, <laughs> Pam, Pam and I have a very good relationship, and she, we, we love each other, and she has to love me. So here's the, here's the deal. Your life is a mess. You've got pockets of your life that God is still working on that are hurting, that are burdensome. You can duct tape it shut and never talk about it, or you can come to God and open up that door. Just because the door's shut does not mean there's not a mess there. Come to God with your mess. Let's approach God with your mess. Now, here's a second thought. Not only do we need to learn to approach God with our mess, childlike faith would not be afraid of coming to God with a mess. We also need to learn to approach God in belief. We need to learn to approach God with, with belief. I think this is a really key element to what Jesus is saying here when he says, for such as the kingdom of God belongs to these. When Jesus says that the kingdom of God is built on people with childlike faith, I think that the, the belief 
and the radical belief and imagination and hope of a child that's undiminished by the callousness and the difficulties of life is what we're called to have in Christ. Like the imagination and the hope and the radical belief that children have, we should have. You know, think about it this way. Like every, every kindergartner, when you ask them what they want to do when they grow up, they are radical, big dreams. Their imagination is full. I mean, kids will tell you, I want to grow up and be the president of the United States. I want to be, a, I want to be Batman when I grow up. I want to be a superhero. I want to be this person. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be all these things. When, when you ask a young kid what they want to do with their life, they, their imagination doesn't have the realistic limits that we have. You know, my five-year-old, or when, when Jackson came to me and said, I think I want to be president one day, I didn't tell him, nah, you'll never be president. But in my head, that's what I'm doing. I'm going, yeah, right. Like, unless something crazy happens, like, you're not going to be president, buddy, so let's, let's, keep, let's, let's, keep, uh, let's keep thinking about our careers. You know, we get, we get really realistic as adults. But children don't have those imagination caps. You know, one, time when, um, one time there was an earthquake. Remember a couple of years ago, five or six Maybe, maybe even more, like seven years ago, there was that big earthquake that happened in the afternoon. And um, we had just bought our house maybe, maybe a few months before, a couple months before that. And, um, and like the whole house was shaking. And Kaylin was like three at the time. My oldest was like three at the time. So she was taking a nap. And the whole house starts shaking. My wife starts freaking out, going to get the kids and running out of the house. And, um, and Kaylin wakes up and she sits up on her bed when Pam opens the door after this earthquake. And she goes, Mommy? Tell Daddy to tell that dinosaur to stop shaking our house, and he needs to fix it and make it stronger. Tell, tell, tell Daddy to stop that dinosaur from shaking the house, and tell him to fix it so, it doesn't, so it's stronger. So here's Kaylin, my three-year-old, who first and foremost is, thinks I can fix our house from an earthquake, and that if there was a dinosaur shaking our house, that somehow I would have the means to stop it. That's a radical belief in our parent, isn't it? That is, that is a radical confidence in me. Undeserving, by the way, because there's no, I, if there was a dinosaur shaking our house, I'm running like every single other person. But, but, but that, that confidence is what we should have in God, right? Kalen's was misplaced, cute, but misplaced. Our confidence should be that in God. So we should, in our prayers, approach God with belief. Approach God believing that he can do the things we're praying for. Um, imagining that he can do more than we can imagine he can do. And that's one of the values of our church. We call it a k- value of kingdom risk. That we want to we pray and see God do things that seem unreasonable and unattainable in and of ourselves. We want to have full-on imaginations for what God can do. And I really believe this. When we look at people and situations without an imagination for what God can really do, it always limits our prayers. When we look at the, the hardships and the situations that are going on around in our lives without uh, an imagination for what God can do, then, then we're going to pray small prayers. We're going to believe small things about what God can do. So, so we have to learn to believe God like a child, that, that such as the kingdom belongs to these, to believe that God can do things that we think are impossible, change lives, turn around situations that we think could never happen could never happen. Now, even just in this church, 13 months ago, there were two people in this auditorium worshiping with us. I told this story at our anniversary service. It was like some, some late, late June or July. Our, our, we, like the, the, we only had like three or four people on our worship team at that time. We got up to sing, and there are two people in this, in this room. My wife running soundboard and an, an older gentleman who had fallen asleep during my sermon. And we thought to ourselves, this is going nowhere. Like, we believe God wants us to put a church here, but, but it's not going anywhere. So what we did was we believed that God had called us here, that God wanted to grow his church. We began praying and serving, and God's been done an amazing thing in just 13 months as we've seen his church built up and communities changed. We have to believe that God can do incredible things. Like a child believes their, believes their parents can do amazing things. And, uh, and their children are brazen, by the way. Think about how a child asks. Like, I would, it would not be uncommon for my child to come to me this afternoon and say, hey, Dad, can we go to Disneyland today? Like, can we just fly to Orlando and go to Disneyland? 
Or, hey, Dad, can you introduce me to this person? Or, can we do this? Can we do that? Can I have this? Children are not afraid to ask for what they need or think they need in their lives. Why not have that attitude before God? That's childlike faith. So here's my thought. Underneath our weak prayers is a weak view of God. Underneath our weak prayers is a weak belief in God. We just don't see God the way we need to see God. And I love what this story, let me just read you a story. This is out of Luke chapter, you don't need to turn there, but Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a story about how we ought to be with our prayer. And I think there's a childlike nature here. This is, the, this is a parable called the, the persistent widow, the widow who would not take no for an answer. Luke chapter 8, let me just read it to you, verse 1 through 8. Now, Jesus told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. So pray always and not give up. He said this story. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And there was a widow in that town that kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge said. Will God not grant his justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth. That story tells us this. Keep asking God. Believe that God can do it. I mean, my kids will ask me for things over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, like, they, they don't stop. And in fact, Jackson has a countdown for his birthday. And he's going he's gonna to talk about it every single day and ask about it every single day. When they want something, it's like one track mind. They're going to ask and ask and ask and ask. And what, what you see here in this parable is God invites us to do that with him. To be bold and to believe and to ask. And yes, we're praying according to God's will and, and looking and hoping in him. But we need to pray with belief. If your prayers were answered, what would they show you about your belief in God? Big God or small God? If tomorrow every single one of your prayers for the last week were answered, how would the world change? How would your community change? How would things be different? The answer to that question will measure how you approach God with a childlike belief or this broken, calloused adult filter that we often put on our lives. Childlike faith is how we ought to pray. Here's the last thought. We need to learn to approach God without all this structure. Now, I say this with a, with a bit of a warning. Yes, we, we want to pray with God. We, we looked at the Lord's Prayer last week, and Jesus gave us a model prayer, and there was structure to it. There were themes to it. There were directions to it. But at the same time, if a child, if we want to have a childlike prayer life, then there's going to be times when we communicate with God in a childlike way. That means there's not a lot of structure. My kids don't have structured conversations with me all the time. In fact, the younger they are, the less structured they are. They're random. They're what's right on their minds. They're, they're what's burning in their hearts. They're here. They're there. There's a piece there. You know, they'll, they'll ask me a question. They'll go back to playing. They'll come back and ask me another question. There's not a lot of structure to that. Real conversation doesn't have a lot of structure. And so if we're really going to come to God with this childlike faith and childlike prayer life, then we don't always have to have these structural walls of this is how we have to pray, this is what we have to say, this is what we're going to say. We can just talk to God. We can just let our minds wander before God. We, sometimes wandering minds are good because when there are things on your hearts, the Spirit can nudge you that direction. Your, your hearts pull you in that direction, and so we can bring them up before God. So don't, don't think that your prayers always have to be structured. We are children of God, sons of God, daughters of God. And so we can come to God with just talking to him, just speaking to him. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says this. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. 
Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. We can talk to God like a son to his father. And sometimes there's structure, and sometimes there's formality, but other times it's just, God, it's been a hard day. And you just pour yourself out before God, and you lay yourself out before God, and you just talk to him. We want to open up our prayer life to not always have to have structure, but be rooted in relationship. We are God's sons, God's children. And so we need faith like a child. Jesus says, let the little children come, for such belong to the kingdom of God. That ought to be our heart. That ought to be our desire to to come to God in prayer. And I promise you, if you can begin to pray like a child, you can begin to embrace that childlike faith before God, and it will change how you go about our life. We are not dependent. We are needy before God, and we cannot forget to come to God both messy, with belief, and just at times pouring ourselves out in an unstructured way before him. Maybe, a, maybe there's some prayers you need to make this morning. Maybe there's something that's, 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 that's some of the mess that's in your life that you've been afraid to talk to God about just because of conviction and difficulty. But maybe you need to take a moment as we close in song to, to, to pray that before God. Maybe there's something that you love to see happen in your life that you believe God wants for your life, but there's a lack of belief in your own heart that you need to be able to come before God and say, God, if this is your will, you, this, this, I believe that you can change this situation. I, I believe that you can do things that, that are beyond my imagination. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Christ with your life. You've never come to Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible tells us that, that we are all separated from God because of our sins. Our sins, the things that we've done outside of God's plan, pull us from God. He can't have a relationship with us in our sin. But he sent Jesus Christ, his son, who lived a perfect and sinless life, who went to the cross and died on the cross, not just for himself, but as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus Christ was perfect, so he didn't need to die for his sins. We did. But because he was perfect and sinless and the Son of God, when he died, he died as a substitute in our place so that our sins could be forgiven and now we could have a relationship with God. He was buried and he rose three days later. The Bible tells us to receive the gift of salvation purchased by Christ on the cross. We simply repent or turn from our sins and believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And in a prayer, just simply saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I want, I need his salvation. I want to live for him. That prayer, like a child before our Heavenly Father, can change our lives. Let's take a moment to pray together.